unity is the end game, not the first step. And uniformity is not the way to get there. The first step to unity, oddly enough, is often division. Division can be a sign that we are finally telling the truth about who we are, how different our experiences have been, the gaps in our knowledge, the lies that comfort us, the fears that hold us in their grip, the resentments we can't let go, the prejudices and preconceived notions, even the dreams we've let die, and the hopes that have been dashed. Unity is the end game, not the first step. This is true for families and churches and nations. A certain kind of division can threaten to destroy us, there's no doubt. A kind of division that's brought on by sheer meanness and dehumanization and demonization of our fellow citizens. But premature calls for unity will also be our downfall. We might survive them, but only to suffer the prolonged and painful death of our souls. We've been hearing a lot of calls for unity and healing in the news lately, following on the heels of a contentious and fretful election season. What are we to make of these as Christians? You know, in Scripture, unity is not always a good thing. And division is not always evil. Nor is the reverse always true. Division is not always good, and unity is not always bad. You might remember when Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, says that he has come to bring division between family members. He says he comes to bring not peace, but the sword. But then that same Jesus in the Gospel of John prays that all of his disciples might come together in a spirit of unity, before he is to die and be resurrected and ascend back into heaven. The Apostle Paul talks about how for Christians there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but that all are one in Christ Jesus. Yet the early church was no stranger to conflict and division. And in Ephesians, when Paul talks about the need for unity, he hinges that unity on the practice of truth-telling. Telling the truth is how we get to unity. So that's why we read the story of the Tower 
of Babel this morning. A story about a time when there was only one language on the earth. When people used the same words. And this unity of language and speech made them feel as if there was nothing they couldn't accomplish. So they set out to build a city, and within that city, a tall tower. As scripture says to, quote, make a name for themselves. You might think that God would have been impressed with their ability to cooperate and work together that he would have seen their building project as a sign of power and success. But upon seeing this new outbreak of construction, God looks down from above and determines that this activity must be brought to an end. And the scripture says that God says that there is no limit to what these people will do. This week when I was reflecting on this passage, the question that kept coming forth in my mind was, why in the heck are they building a tower? of all the things that they might cooperate and do, why would this be their first inclination to build a tower? Was everybody on board with building the tower? Who built the tower? Who benefited from the building? of a tower. Tall towers, even in our 21st century world, are so often symbols of wealth, power, even domination. And it seems that the divine sees it this way too. That in trying to make a name for themselves, the people of Babel have lost sight of their own dependence on divine power. Their so-called unity has become an intoxicating influence, causing them to dispense with humility causing them to have a sense, an overinflated sense of their own power and influence and potential, apart from their dependence on divine love and grace. We've been hearing a lot of calls for unity and healing in our country the past week. In the Christian tradition, calls for unity and healing often swirl around the notion of forgiveness. Last week in the Sermon on the Mount, we read uh, Jesus' admonition to Christians who are about to gather together around the holy table to remember if they have their their fellow Christian has anything against them if they have done anyone wrong to make it right before coming to the table The emphasis in that scenario is on the one who has done wrong, acknowledging their error, 
and taking action to repair the damage done. Before seeking the forgiveness and reconciliation that is symbolized by the gathering together at the table. Jesus is deeply rooted in the Jewish tradition. In Matthew's Gospel, they call him rabbi, teacher. And in the Jewish tradition, forgiveness is a deeply relational act. In our popular culture, and even so often in our Christian churches, we talk about forgiveness as a kind of letting go of personal bitterness and resentment. And these are aspects of forgiveness, important for our own spiritual health and well-being. But forgiveness in the Bible is a deeply relational act. And in Jewish tradition, the practice of teshuvah is a prerequisite for the expectation of forgiveness. One who has done wrong and harmed their fellow human is expected to practice teshuvah, to acknowledge their sin, to take concrete steps of action to repair the damage done, and only then to approach the person or people they have harmed and ask for forgiveness. In Jewish tradition, the party that has done wrong is advised to ask for forgiveness up to three times before they can be absolved of the guilt of their wrongdoing. If they ask for forgiveness, in the first place, and the wrong party refuses, they try again, and again, a third time, each time making new attempts to repair the damage done. Only on the third occasion, if the person they have harmed refuses to offer forgiveness, only then, is the person who refuses to forgive considered to be in the wrong. So in the Gospels, when Jesus encourages us, compels us that we must be willing to forgive 70 times 7, in no way is he dispensing with the practice of teshuvah or relieving us from the practices of confession and repentance, repair and reconciliation that are prerequisites for forgiveness. There is a tendency in Christianity to gloss over these practices of confession and repentance placing all the emphasis on forgiveness. But like unity, forgiveness is the end game, not the first step. And ask yourself who this tendency to gloss over confession and repentance, who does this benefit, this focus on forgiveness? at the expense of all the actions that re precede it? The answer is people with power who are in the wrong. People in power who are in the wrong benefit when people in their care are overlooked and abused and oppressed and then expected and encouraged 
to offer forgiveness in the absence of accountability. This happens in families where painful secrets get buried, in churches locked in unhealthy patterns, and of course, in a nation like ours where over 400 years after the first African slaves arrived on our shores, we still have not dealt with the depth of greed, bigotry, and white supremacy at the heart of our founding. In Babel, in the story of that misguided erection of a tower, we see God scattering the peoples, using division as the first step toward healing. Scholars often say that the New Testament story of Pentecost is really where the story of Babel resolves. Pentecost is the story where people who come from diverse nations, ethnicities, cultures, and creeds, people who speak all kinds of languages and use all kinds of words, come together in a way that unifies and heals. Without the temptations to power and domination represented by the Tower of Babel. At Pentecost, by the power of the Spirit, these diverse peoples were able to speak their distinctive truths. They were able to understand each other, even though they did not speak in one language. And ultimately, they ignited a movement for peace, love, and justice that has lasted two millennia because they sought truth and authenticity as prerequisites for unity. Yesterday, the Reverend Tracy Blackman, who is the national coordinator for social justice initiatives in the United Church of Christ, told a story about how recently she has moved into a new home and she's been feeling for weeks like the water just was never getting quite hot enough in her shower. She kept trying to convince herself that she could deal with the lukewarm water. Then, when she could no longer convince herself of that, she decided to call a plumber. Having convinced herself that she would have to get a new water heater. But the plumber came and five minutes later declared that the problem had been fixed. Reverend Blackman, the previous homeowner, had just turned down the temperature on your water heater. All you needed to do was just turn up the heat. Reverend Blackman says that in these days and months and years that have followed this period of intense division in our country, Reverend Blackman says that before we get to unity and healing, we have to keep bringing the heat. That Pentecostal fire. And I agree with her. I agree with Reverend Blackman. 
So church, if it sounds like today I am calling you to a greater level of truth-telling and authenticity, I am. If it sounds like I'm asking you to do a power analysis in practically all of your relationships, including the ones that we practice together in this congregation, I am. I'm asking you to see who benefits from the status quo and calls for unity and healing. If it sounds like I'm inviting you to, yes, set boundaries when necessary for your spiritual and emotional health, but also challenging you to expand your capacity for hard conversations. Yes, I am doing that too. Because in families and churches and nations, these hard conversations are precisely where the energy is for figuring out who we are and what we are called to do. This is where the Spirit can help us learn to speak and to listen across our differences and fill us with holy passion. Without these conversations, we might survive, but there can be no lasting peace no true justice, and ultimately, no vitality. So if it sounds like I am asking you to be a little more brave, that's true too. It's because I believe that's what Jesus asked of all of us. And because I believe you are up to the task, and because I believe our future, as families, as a church, as a nation, depend on it. May it be so. Amen.